morning. Let's, uh, let's take a moment to pray. As we need to. Father, we are here this morning, and we know that we know there's no place in all of existence we can go where you are not. And yet, you have also promised there is a way in which you are present in a special way when people are gathered in your name. You told us where three or three gathered in your name, you are there among us, so we know you are here now. And we ask you to help us put aside all the, uh, whatever weighs us down, whatever draws our attention away from this place, whether or not it's the past tugging on us, regret, or the future pressing on us with worry, or it's just stuff outside of this place that uh, is drawing our attention. We ask that you would help us center and focus here now to be with you, to sing to you, to hear from you, and to receive from you. So we ask your spirit to guide our time together. In Jesus' name. Let's stand. <laughs> we gather in the name of the Father, Creator of all things, in the name of the Son, God in the flesh, Emmanuel, who reconciles us to the Father, in the name of the Holy Spirit, who grants us faith and leads us into life now.
few announcements we want to uh, want to cover here. I'd like to, I heard the uh, sale went pretty well yesterday. Got a, a report on that. Yes, I do. I do. First of all, I'd like to thank the Crasses and the Burgalis for helping me. We did a lot of work on Friday to prepare for it, and everyone else who baked goodies for it. And um, we made the table of seven hundred. I will admit that it exceeded my expectations. Yay! Next, we got a uh, confirmation class today. Just note the time that we have a confirmation student 130 to 3 because we have the voters assembly today right after church. Uh, Operation Christmas Child, just want to encourage you if you haven't already. Uh, Karen does a lovely job every week setting up the table to help remind us to bring those boxes. It's um, some of those box the kids only get one box their entire life. They don't go back to the same place over and over again. There's enough kids who need the, the toys and the gospel that uh, there's more than enough. They never get a second box. So I encourage you to participate in that. Uh, any other announcements before we get yeah, John? Men's, men's group. Men's group on Thursday. I have, for the last three days, I've been thinking, there's one more thing I need to add to the people. There's one more thing. Thank you. Uh, and then also, for those of you, last week was Reformation Sunday, and uh, we have a printout here explaining Martin Luther's seal. It's called, or they also call it the Luther Rose. It's on the table. You can pick that up and uh, read. It's very interesting. It's always good to know the meaning of things. Symbols don't mean anything unless you know what they mean. So... That's a good one to learn about. Yeah? I do have one more. Uh, we had a couple that stopped by the yard sale, and they saw the sign that was for uh, the church, and she said, well, what's, what's the church? It's a Lutheran. She said, we're looking for a Lutheran church. <laughs> they are snowbirds, and they, uh, they've been looking, so I told her where we met, and uh, she said, I don't think we'll be here this Sunday, but next Sunday we're here. So that was that was that's great. Yeah. Anything else? All right. Today is All Saints Day. And I don't know if anybody uh, took me up on my email offer to bring something. In the last couple of years, we have brought things that um, symbolize for us the, the, uh, our loved ones who've gone on. And I emailed them off. And anybody, if anybody wanted to bring stuff and put it on the altar as part of our our time together. You can do that at the end of the service, and we'll include that. I mean, you can do it after the sermon, and we'll include those uh, in our prayer. Uh, thanking God for all of the loved ones that we've had in our lives. So, All Saints Day, we remember those who have gone on before us. And our reading for today is from the book of Revelation, which uh, is uh, uh, a book filled with imagery about all sorts of things, but one of the things it provides for us is uh, imagery and a way to think about our eternal life. And, and, and of course, we can't actually visualize that because it's a different uh, way of, it's a whole, it's the renewal of everything. It's the new heaven, the new earth. And, you know, we get all these different pictures. But one of the things we can do uh, is know kind of, we can, we can trust how it's going to be for us and as individuals, even though we won't know like it's hard to, Visualize physically, we can we can hear what the Bible says about what it's going to be for us as people, like how it's going to feel to be there, and things like that. So here is Revelation chapter seven, verses nine through seventeen. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne. And before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, they were crying out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. 
And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving, honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders talked to me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? And I said to him, Sir, you know. And he replied to me, These are the ones who came out of the great tribulation. They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God, serve him day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither shall they thirst any more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. We invite the children to come forward for the children's message. So today we have this passage about heaven, right? And, and some of that, uh, when I read some of these things, some of it's it's hard for me to understand. I can't understand how I could just, uh, you know, say the words holy, holy, holy forever and think that that's an enjoyable way to spend my time. This is a kind of a word picture of what heaven's going to be like. Uh, it's a vision that was given to the Apostle John. And it tries to paint for us kind of a picture of what heaven's going to be like. And as you grow, you're going to get different, you're going to have questions. You're like, what's that going to be like? How are we going to be? Are we going to be like, uh, does everybody like sit around on clouds and play harps? Or what's heaven going to be like? And part of the problem is we, there's no way for us to know what heaven is going to be like. Because it's going to be a whole new existence. Every time you grow kind of into a new stage, you learn that you didn't quite know what life was like. And when you get grown up, what you're going to find out is, as a child, you didn't quite know what grown up life was going to be like. And the problem is, when we grow up, we start to think we know everything. We start to think we've kind of hit the end. And one of the things Jesus said is, you don't enter the kingdom of God unless you become like a little child. So as we grow up, what we've got to remember is we still don't know everything. Because that's, kids are learners, and grown-ups need to be learners too. We'll never know. Right. But, and, that's, and, and so that actually takes me to my point, is the thing that they're really, he's really trying to talk about with Kevin here is this part in the end. There are things that are hard for us. It's, it, it, we, we live pretty nice lives. None of us really... Uh, none of us have to worry about where our food is coming from. Okay? None of you have ever had to skip a meal, probably, because you just didn't have any food. So, um, but other people do. And so when he talks about heaven, he talks about all the things that cause us pain and trouble in God. He says there's not going to be any hunger. No one's ever going to get thirsty again. And then the last line in this passage is the one that I think is so powerful because it speaks to us. No matter how old we are, you can be two years old or five years old or eight years old or ten years old or twenty years old or fifty years old like me or eighty years old like some of the people here today. And every one of us can hear these words. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And that sounds pretty good because we all have different kinds of sadness in our life. And this says that when we, get, when we go to heaven to be with Jesus forever, that our sadness will be gone. That's what it means when it says we'll wipe away every tear from our eyes. So when you think about heaven, there's obviously going to be things we don't understand. But one of the things that the Bible makes very clear is that whatever ways we suffer, whatever things cause us tears and cry, all that will be over. And that's part of what God gives us when He gives us heaven through Jesus. And you can... Uh, that's the end of the children's message. You guys can go, and I will uh, get done. If you will.
morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to remind everybody to go ahead and complete the green card, playing out the one side lane so that you're here this morning. On the other side, for your prayer requests and praise reports, and then after the sermon, just go ahead and put them up here in the front of the uh, offering plate. Remembering to check the two small boxes as applicable to let Pastor know whether people are being allowed uh, during the service. And then uh, we, at the same time, if you have an offering, go ahead and put that in your plate. This is our opportunity to worship God with an offering to God to support the ministry here in Lake Nona and beyond. Uh, if you are a visitor, there's no obligation, but this is our opportunity as regular attenders and supporters of this ministry to contribute um, towards it. And we go to pray this course this morning. Heavenly Father, it's good to be gathered here again to start off the week in your presence. And we ask that you uh, help us be receptive to the words you want us to hear from Pastor John this morning. And block the words you don't want them to hear. <laughs> That's what I can pray a lot of the time. So we're, we're talking about, um, we're talking about heaven today. It's, uh, it's All Saints Day, and we're thinking about people who have uh, died and gone, gone to heaven before us, and we're, we're thinking about heaven, and we're thinking about how that can impact our lives right now. Most of the time when we're studying the scriptures, we're kind of looking for how to live. We're, we're looking for how to live right now, because that's where we live. We live right now. But the scriptures make it really, really, really clear that the idea of eternal life, the idea of when we pass on and go to be with Jesus forever, just like Jesus told the people on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. That idea is a core and central part of our faith. There's, there's uh, uh, people who follow Christ and think that, that Jesus has, uh, has supreme ethics to be followed, but they reject the resurrection. They reject uh, the spirit living on beyond the body. And uh, they reject the idea of eternal life. They just follow Christ for his ethical principles, which are supreme. But, as people who follow the scriptures, from uh, the Reformation, grace alone, faith alone, and scripture alone, uh, we cannot help but acknowledge and rejoice in not only what Jesus does for us to, to empower our lives this life, but to rejoice in and look forward to life everlasting with Christ. Life beyond this life is foundational to the Christian faith. And so it's important that we think about and contemplate and let the idea of eternal life weigh on our present. Because C.S. Lewis talks about how the future, when it gets here, looks, I'm not, not going to say it as well as he does, but, but when, when the future gets here, it changes the way we experience now. And the, the example, I think, that, that is the clearest example is many of us have been on adventures of one type or another. Struggles where we didn't know how it was going to come out. And it could be something like small, it could, could be something emotional, could be something like physical, like, okay. So, uh, in high school, I was driving too fast, and I went around a corner, and there was gravel on the corner, on the road, and my car spun out, and rolled over the sun. That was quite an adventure. And I pushed the car, and, and me and my friend was in pushed the car back over, and drove home. <laughs> and the next day, that was cool. That was an adventure. But was it an adventure when all I could see was... No, it wasn't in the middle. It's, it's the way it turns out that makes it an adventure instead of a tragedy. It's the, it's the way that you can look back on it that interprets how that event really is. C.S. Lewis thought that people who end up with Christ in heaven will look back on earth and say they have always been in heaven. 
And he thought that people ended up away from Christ in hell will look back on earth and say they've always been in hell. And I think that's an interesting thought because, because it, it does seem to me that the, that the future <coughs> tends to write our interpretation of present events. And so our, the idea that we are headed toward a future should affect the way we view the things that we are going through now, the struggles that we face, the joys we get to embrace. Paul said that this idea of the resurrection is key to our entire life. He wrote, ooh, uh, that, that, that somehow the shadow didn't get put on that text. He wrote, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and so is your faith. And so the idea that Jesus was raised from the dead, and we too will be raised from the dead to a new and eternal life where there is no more sorrow, sickness, suffering, pain, or death, where God will wipe away every tear, makes life more like a roller coaster than a mountain climb. What's the difference between a roller coaster and a mountain climb? On a roller coaster, it's all engineered, and it's safe. And it's scary, but assuming you don't have a heart attack, you're going to get to the end, and you're going to pull that iron bar up, and it's all going to be okay. Even though you might... I have freaked out a couple times in the middle of roller coasters. You, now, you know they, um, they just approved construction plans for the, the tower roller coaster, by the way, next to the Orlando Eye? It's going to be 500 feet tall. <laughs> Uh, the Orlando Eye, for your reference, is 400 feet tall. So it's going to be 100 feet taller than the Orlando Eye. And you get in the car, and you go up, and then you go up to the very top of that thing. And then it's like, oh, wow. I'm going to think I'm going to have to write it, but I don't know. We'll see. But the idea is that a roller coaster is terror, but, it, but you know you're going to get off the end, and it's going to be okay. If you go mountain climbing, people die, right? I mean, mountain climbing is, when you go to get your life insurance, they do not ask you if you ride roller coasters. But they do ask you if you like to mountain climb, or skydive, or things like that, because those are actually dangerous. Now that's like, the le that's a narrow lens of this life. If we back off a little bit and look at the lens of eternity, this life becomes a roller coaster because the blood of Jesus is like an iron bar around our soul, holding us in, even though life takes us all over the place. And, and uh, unlike roller coasters where we can see where we're going, um, life doesn't let us look at the track ahead of time. But as we go through life, we can know that in the end, we will be pulling into the station and the bar is going to come off, and we're going to walk out safely. Our spirits are going to be safe with Christ forever, and that gives us the uh, that gives us the ability to uh, to handle the twists and turns, and even enjoy the adventure as tough as it can be sometimes. So, life beyond this life is a foundation. It, it, it draws us forward. We remember that that. Uh, that our spirits are safe. The second thing the Bible says is that, is that about this eternal life that we need to remember as we look into this world, and maybe even as we move through next Tuesday, is that in the end, God is the one who's going to make everything right. The Bible says in the end, everything's going to be made right. Everything will be made right. God has redeemed things, and everything is going to be made right in the end. Jesus, was, when he was preaching, he, he preached this little set of uh, sayings called the Beatitudes. And here's, uh, here's what he said. He said, uh, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, because they're going to inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, because they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. 
When you, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who came before you. So what Jesus is saying underneath here, if you, there's, there's some assumptions. Jesus says that's the way things look now, but that's not the way it's going to ultimately turn out. If you, and again, it's a matter of your vision, your scope. If your scope is this life only, then all you have is why do the wicked prosper? Because sometimes they do. If, 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 the, if the scope of your vision is earthly life only, it's very hard for you to say things like, blessed are the poor in spirit, those who feel the need of their spirit. That's a blessed state. Why would that be a blessed state if this life is all we have? But if we have eternal life in Jesus Christ, and to recognize your need of spirit is to turn to Christ and to be welcomed into his eternal kingdom, then indeed, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. That doesn't seem like it's true in the narrow lens of this life. But if we back off, and that's what All Saints Day is about, backing off and getting a wider focus on eternal life, if we, see, if we get a wider focus of eternal life, then we see, yes, indeed, blessed are those who mourn. Because one of the things that causes us to mourn is the recognition that this life is not as it is supposed to be, is not as God created it to be, and one day the restoration will come, and that is when the mourning, those who mourn will be comforted, and on and on through the rest of the Beatitudes. Blessed are the meek. That doesn't seem like a very uh, earthly kind of thing. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Blessed are those who want to live really righteous lives. They don't seem to get ahead in this world. Blessed are the merciful. That's not how you get ahead in this world. You get ahead by crushing your opponents. And grinding them into dirt. No, that's not true. I don't, I don't think that's true. So, so we, we back off. We're trying to get our vision to be this larger, our focus to see ourselves not just in the, the, the narrow focus of earthly life, but in the focus of sojourners through the earthly life, travelers through the earthly life, headed toward eternal life with Christ. Because when we do that, we see that... that um, that our perspective is larger and the things that seem to be true now, God is going to flip. There's going to be a great uh, restoration and all will be made right. Now, when we stop to talk about All Saints Day, there is one thing that I, that always, um, it's, and it is that not all the people I love have died with a proclaimed faith in Jesus. Not all the people I, I love have died trusting in Jesus as far as I know. And so when I get to All Saints Day, it's like this, it's a, it's a two-tiered kind of thing. It's, it's like... On the one hand, I can rejoice because, because I know Jesus and I know what Jesus has done for me and I can trust him. I can rejoice for uh, my dad who died in faith, but what do I do? I, half of my family is Mormon. Uh, and what's God going to do with Mormons? Because, you know, Mormons believe that when they die, if they die a good Mormon, their spirits go to a new planet with their wife and they begin to bear spirit children and populate their own planet, and they get to be gods of their own planet. So they've got a very different idea of what Jesus does for them. One of their phrases is, as, as we are, God once was. As God is, so we will be. So what happens to all my Mormon loved ones? What happens to my, uh, my older sister, who doesn't believe in Jesus? She said, She's a great person, but she's certainly not a practicing Christian. 
Although, behavior and attitude-wise, I would put her up against an awful lot of practicing Christians in terms of kindness and compassion. And, and you all know people like that. You all know people who you would look at them and say, if it weren't for the fact that the word Jesus doesn't come out of their mouth, they're a better Christian than a lot of Christians. So what happens there? What happens to all this? It's just, for me, All Saints Day brings up a lot of brings up as many questions as it does answers. And so I want to be honest about that. I want us to take a moment to reflect on that and and maybe even find some peace with that. So there may be things, this is this is what I draw out of the scriptures. There may be things we wish were not so, but there will be no injustice or unmercifulness. And unmercifulness is probably not a word. But you know what it means, even if it's not a word. And maybe I get to coin a word today. The good news, the good news is not that you can figure out who's going to go to heaven. That's not the good news. Because if you could figure out who's going to heaven, then it would be based on rules that you could observe and, and see if people are following those things at all. The good news is not that you get to decide who goes to heaven or that you even should be thinking about it. Last week we saw Paul said, I don't even judge myself. The good news is you can step off that chair altogether and quit trying to judge anybody. Because the good news is who is deciding who goes to heaven? Who is deciding the eternal fate of every person who ever lived? Who's the one? Who's the one that gets to gets to point to the left or to the right to each soul as the soul approaches that person? Who is it? That's the good news. It's Jesus. When, when um, Peter was preaching, he said, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. The good news is not that there's a heaven and you can get there and you can figure out who's going there. The good news is there's a heaven and the person who's deciding who goes there is Jesus. That's really good news. If you follow the life of Jesus and look for who Jesus accepted, look for who Jesus embraced, look at the way Jesus treated people when they were broken and down and depressed and, and, and sinning and making the wrong choices, what do you see? I'm so glad it's Jesus and not me. That's what I see. Paul said the same thing. When Paul was trying to preach to the people who had, in, in, on Mars Hill, the, the Greeks who had no idea about Jewish beliefs, he said, he said the same thing about what the good news really is. The good news is that Jesus is in charge of everything. And he's the ultimate guy. This is what he said to the people. He said, God has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to everyone by raising him from the dead. When Paul had to distill, when Paul had to to, to narrow the good news down to its most central focus, because he was speaking to people who had no Jewish history whatsoever. When Paul had to figure out what is the gospel in this, on the size of a head of a pen, it is this. There will be a judgment, and that judgment is in the hands of Jesus. And when I think of judgment is in the hands of Jesus, it, it, uh, it, it gives my soul because I cannot imagine a circumstance where Jesus would decide something and I would say, that is totally unfair. I can't imagine a circumstance where Jesus would decide something and I would say, that was ungracious. I can't, dec- I can't imagine a situation where Jesus would decide something and I would say, that was unjust. That was like, that's not fair. You can't imagine Jesus doing that. I don't know what Jesus is going to do with everybody else. But what I know is that the eternal destiny of every soul is in the hands of this guy. And I think I have really good news. 
It speaks to my soul. And it lets me have peace about people that I don't know. I don't know, who, I don't know what their interior was like or anything. Because the thing that matters is not even that. It's Jesus. It's just Jesus. It's like on the, on the Mount of the Transfiguration. When there was a cloud and, and, and then the disciples looked up and they saw only Jesus. When Paul had to narrow down the gospel to people who had no Old Testament knowledge at all, he said it's about Jesus. God has put Jesus in charge of the world. And we can't imagine Jesus doing something that we would be upset or angry about. And so we do have a call to share the good news about Jesus with others. But it's not because we're it's not, it's not because we are responsible for their eternal destiny. Jesus is responsible for their eternal destiny. He's going to decide where they go, not you. We do have a responsibility to tell them this good news about Jesus. And so as we celebrate All Saints Day, I think there's, there's a few things that we can sort of grab onto. One is that uh, though we have the clear promise that those who have died in faith are with Christ. And so for our loved ones who have died in faith, we know exactly where they are. We can trust Jesus completely with their soul. For those who have died without professing faith, we know whose hands they're in. They are in the hands of Jesus, whom we cannot imagine doing something unfair or unjust with them. And we know that our job is to speak of this to people in our lives. What Paul said. That God will be judging the world, and the man he has appointed to do it is Jesus. And he's given assurance of this by his name. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we celebrate Jesus with all those who have gone before us, those who are already standing around the throne, shouting, holy, holy, holy. We're also aware that other people have died without a, uh, a confession of Christ on their lips. But we're also aware that Jesus is the judge of the world, and when sinners were thrown at his feet, he said, neither do I condemn you, now go and sin no more. That he didn't come to judge the world, but the world might be saved through him. So, give us a vision of eternity, of great joy, where people from all nations and all languages and all peoples are all celebrating your grace given in Jesus Christ. Give us freedom from the idea that we are sitting in some sort of judgment seat, that we can actually look at people and figure out where they're going, because they're not in our hands, they're in Jesus' hands. But also give us those words on our lips that all had from the people in Mars Hill. In whatever way it works in our culture and language and, and, and among our friends and family and our acquaintances, that there that this life is not the end, that there will be a judgment, and that judgment is in the hands of Jesus. And he is merciful. And he wants to hand that mercy to us, not just when we die, but right now. So we can live in peace. All of them. And yes, that in his name. <coughs> so, a couple of questions for you to think about for the next four minutes. One is how does belief in eternal life affect your decisions with respect to the resources of your earthly life? If the whole thing is a big temporary, it's like a board game, it's only hold it up someday. How does that affect? How do you use the resources of your earthly life? What do you do with your time and your talents and your treasure? And number two is, how can contemplating eternity with Christ, Jesus, change the way you treat other people today? And how can it change the way you treat yourself? So we'll take a short break and then we will uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper. Feel free to bring your offerings up in your prayer place.
Let's stand as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess yes, our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Loving Father, we acknowledge that nothing we do is perfectly holy. Not our actions, not our words, not our thoughts. Love for you and others does not always hide our lives. If we had ever heard your love and acceptance, we know we would be lost forever. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that your will is our delight and our lives for you. Our Heavenly Father has called us through Jesus Christ to proclaim the forgiveness of sins. Therefore, hear this now as from the mouth of Jesus Himself. Your sins are forgiven. Let me repeat that. All is forgiven. Your sin is separated from you as far as the east is from the west. It is hurled into the depths of the sea. In Christ, God has reconciled the world, including you, to Himself. Let your hearts be at peace.
Let's stand to confess together the words of the Apostles. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From where He shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, one the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. We come before you today, Father, with the prayers of our hearts. <coughs> we want to give you thanks for our loved ones that you have put in our lives. The ones that we miss. We miss them because they brought joy and value and, and they contributed to our lives in many various and wonderful ways. And so we want to thank you for their presence in our lives. We want to thank you for the good news of Jesus Christ, that those who have died in him, we can entrust to you fully and completely. We want to pray for courage to speak to those who do not profess Christ about Jesus, about him dying on the cross, and about you appointing him the judge of the world. We lift up to you the things that are going on in our lives now as we pray together as a family. We want to pray for Valerie, that you would give her healing in her relationships. We want to pray for Jill, for continued healing from her long illness. We want to pray for Alexander, Ben, and Charlotte, that they would have a safe and fun trip to Ireland. We want to pray for Jeff, who is continuing in an illness. We pray for his healing and safe travel for families. We want to pray for uh, Skip and Marie, who are going through a time that's kind of stressful for them. We just pray that you give them peace, even as they walk through a time when they won't have all the answers they would like. We want to pray for uh, Luke, the six-year-old grandson of, of Mike and Leanne, who was diagnosed with a brain tumor this week. We want to pray for wisdom for the doctors as they make treatment decisions. And we pray for the uh, Holy Spirit just to rain peace on that whole family and healing. We continue our prayers for Barbara and Ralph as they suffer from dementia. And we, we pray for their families as they walk that road with them that they can Continue in love and patience and understanding and peace. We pray for the local ministries we support, for the Prince of Peace Food Pantry, for Kairos Prison Ministries, for the Central Florida Children's Home. We pray for the mission and ministry workers that are close to our hearts, for Tom and Marilyn, for Wayne and Grace, Mike and Leanne and David and Ruth. We continue our prayers for healing and health, for Brad Tibbs, for Donna Olmstead, and John Bernhau, and Seiko. We continue our prayers for our nation as we enter into these final few days before the election. That uh, more than anything, that peace would prevail, Lord. We pray for peace. We pray for wisdom for whoever gets elected. Uh, that you would guide that person to lead according to your will. We pray for our servicemen and women, and all first responders, but especially those that are deployed overseas, away from the support networks of family and friends. And we pray for people undergoing, that are under persecution all throughout the world for their release. And we pray for persecutors that you would grant them repentance. And we pray for our Christian brothers and sisters that you would uh, give them a miraculous Holy Spirit testimony of love and love for persecutors. We want to especially pray uh, for the uh, surgery of John Burhouse coming up uh, here in the beginning of December to have a defibrillator implanted. We pray that that goes well. 
and, uh, and all the preparations for that would be smooth and the uh, operation would go smoothly and the recovery would be quick. We want to pray about uh, our permanent home. We lift that up to you. We ask you to make that a reality. Uh, we ask you to uh, to move the other church to sell us the property so we can have a permanent home to proclaim your love, to celebrate your life here in uh, Florida. We pray for those who don't know Jesus Christ, who don't know that he died on the cross and that in him all is forgiven. We pray for organizations like uh, Lutheran Bible Translators and Wycliffe and Wycliffe Associates and crew that are uh, engaged in that full time of uh, getting that word of Jesus out. We ask you to bless them in that. We bless us in that, both as a congregation and as individuals, that the, the name of Jesus, and the work of Jesus, and the role of Jesus would be constantly on our hearts and our minds and on our lips so that we can give a good testimony of your love in Jesus Christ to those around us. We ask all this, Father, in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. O our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. We ask this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, and as we forgive those who trespass against us. And he is not a temptation, but the Lord is the one. The God is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on your hand and who is betrayed, took bread and when you give him thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, and said, Take it, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this, for the us of me. In the same way, also after supper, he took the cup and when he gave the thanks, he passed it to his disciples and said, Drink of this, all of you. This cup is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it. Remember this of you. Now may the peace of the Lord be with all of us.
Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have sent your Son to die on the cross. For all who believe in him but not perish but have everlasting life. Thank you that the entire universe is in his hands. Help us to trust him, to find our peace in him, and to speak of him to others, the ones you put in our path. Father, bless us with a vision of our eternal life, so that we can see this life as an important but temporary assignment. So that we can go all in for you and make this life all about all in Christ. We ask that through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
Thanks be to God. May we find the comfort of God that only can be spoken from eternity. And may the heavenly vision guide our lives every day on earth. Amen.